Hello, fellow intelligent investors. So in the world of investing, you will come across all sorts of metrics. You've probably heard of earnings per share, compound annual growth rate, PE ratio, price to book ratio, price to earnings growth ratio, or maybe even the Oldman Z-score. Now, obviously, all of these metrics, they serve a specific purpose. And when you purchase a stock, it makes sense to consider some of the data available to us. However, I could probably list hundreds, if not thousands of investment metrics, and you could implement all of them in your investment process. But I think information overload or having access to too much information will often actually hurt investors as they feel overwhelmed and can't see the forest for the trees. So what if you were only allowed to look at one single metric before buying a stock? Which one would you choose? I think this can be an incredibly interesting thought experiment. And in this video, I will tell you which metric I think is by far the most important metric in investing, at least if you are a long-term investor. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. Okay, so if you have watched some of my yeah, previous videos, you will know that I'm a big believer in the business owner mindset, as opposed to having yeah, a securities trader mindset. If you buy a stock, I want you to mentally always buy the entire business and not just a ticker symbol that will pop up in your broker. Being a business owner, however, implies having a long-term perspective. You're not looking to make a quick buck here and there, but you would rather compound your money over the long term. And obviously to compound your money effectively, you will need to look, take a look at the business itself. And to compound your money at high rates, you obviously want to yeah, own the best businesses that are available to you and that are in your circle of competence. But how do you identify the best companies in the world? Well, if you were only allowed to look at one metric to determine business quality, I would absolutely go for a return on equity or in short ROE. So what is return on equity? Well, the formula is quite simple. It's net income divided by shareholders equity. That's what you will find in most finance books. However, I can imagine that this formula alone leaves many of you perplexed or confused. So let's illustrate what our ROE actually expresses with an analogy. Let's say you want to buy a car and you want to go for the highest quality vehicle. Again, you could ask yourself what would be the single most important metric to look at. Of course, some of you might consider the design and shape of the car yeah, particularly important. Others might say that the car paint is critical. Obviously, the durability of the car model comes to mind. But besides that, I think what is an, an incredibly important factor would be the car's fuel efficiency. Cars are burning fuel and so, so you can compare two different cars and see how far they can go with one liter or one gallon of gas. And that's what a fuel efficiency rating will tell you. And one of the two cars is probably more efficient and therefore maybe a superior model. And here the analogy to businesses comes in. Basically a business is like a car or an engine. If you put in X amount of capital, how much in return will the company deliver? And just like a fuel efficiency rating helps you compare cars, return metrics like return on equity, return on invested capital or return on capital employed, they allow you to compare businesses. Let's assume a hot dog truck that has assets worth of $15,000. For example, this could include the truck itself, some cash in the cashier, uh, inventory such as napkins, spices and drinks and so on and so forth. And then the owner of that truck also has liabilities of $5,000 because he borrowed money to buy the truck in the first place. This means the company's equity is $10,000, $15,000 minus $10,000. If that business generates $500 a year in net income, ROE would be 5%, 500 divided by $10,000. So as a shareholder of this truck, this means that for every dollar of capital that you own in the business, the truck is producing, or the business I should say, is producing five cents of profits. Let's say there is a competing business, hot dog truck B. Shareholders equity is also $10,000, but in contrast to the first truck, the owner of hot dog truck B earns $1,000 annually. Now clearly this truck's operations seem to be much more efficient 
resulting in a higher return on equity of 10%. So which drug would you rather own if you could buy them for the very same price? The answer is obvious, I guess. And again, a 10% ROE tells you that for every dollar you might put in the company, you would, re you would receive 10 cents in income. So broadly speaking, the higher the ROE, the better. So, but what is a really good ROE? Well, Terry Smith, founder and chief exec executive of Fundsmith and author of the phenomenal book, Investing for Growth. He explains in the clip that I'm about to show you that ROE first and foremost needs to be higher than a firm's cost of capital. So let's just take a quick look at that clip. That's our definition briefly of a good company. <laughs> now, don't bother trying to read it because I'm gonna go through each of the points in turn, okay? This is the single most important definition from a financial standpoint of a good company. It makes a high return on operating capital employed in cash. For those of you who are not financial analysts, first of all, congratulations, because there are much more important things to do in life than be a financial analyst. Secondly, you might wonder what exactly that means. The, the amount the company produces in each reporting period, its profit, or even better, its cash flow, divided by the capital employed, which is in its balance sheet, is a high number. Uh, in our current portfolio, it's about 27%, I think. If I'll show it to you later on. I can't remember the exact number myself. That's the most important thing to look at when you're looking at companies. Why? Companies are just like us. Um, it's not that complicated. Um, as it says there, if a company makes a return on capital employed, ROC above its cost of capital, then it grows in value steadily over time. If it makes one below its cost of capital, it falls in value over time. Now, the problem with that statement is I've already got into a technical point there, a cost of capital, which may be completely meaningless to most people. Think of it this way. They are just like us. If you borrowed money uh, from ME Bank at, I don't know what very generous rate they're offering at the moment, but let's call it 5%, and you invested in our fund and we compounded in value for you at about 17 or 18% per annum, you would become richer. I hope we can all agree on that. Mm -hmm. Now, if you borrow from them at 5% and we make you 2% per annum, we're going to make you poorer. Yeah? That's the same with companies. Companies have a cost of capital. People often get very worked up about the fact that it's a, a guess. You have to guess what a company's cost of capital is. You, there are ways of trying to get to it, but it's, it's not something you can prove uh, because it involves a thing called the cost of equity, which don't worry about at all. Start with the assumption it's 10%, because that's what I do, because we're never going to buy a company because it makes 11%, so we don't need to know exactly. We want companies that are going to shoot the lights out and make much higher returns on their cost of capital. If they Personally, I would go one step further even, and I would argue that if the percentage a company earns on its total equity, if that yeah, ROE is lower than 10%, over the long run, you will be better off investing in the S&P 500 index, which has historically returned around 10% annually. You might, you might be wondering why? Well, because for you as a shareholder, it would be better if the business simply paid out its earnings to you so that you could just invest that money at a better yeah, rate of return in the S&P 500. So a CEO ultimately has to try to avoid investments that might increase earnings but offer re a return on invested capital or ROE below the rate of return set by the market. And again, why is that? Well, that's because ROE is a very good way to measure long-term shareholder return almost regardless of your yeah, in initial intrinsic value discount that you paid when you made your initial investment. Over the long run, you will, your return in the investment will roughly mirror the business's earnings, meaning it will reflect the return on equity of the company. Or in other words, if you hold a stock for many years, your total return in that stock over time is going to be equal to the ROE the business generates. And if you don't believe me, let me share the thoughts of yeah, the world's greatest investor, Warren Buffett, with you here. Buffett once said, the inescapable fact is that the value of an asset, whatever its character, cannot over the long term grow faster than its earnings do. And Buffett also stressed the importance of ROE in terms of assessing the skills and effectiveness of a company's management team. As you know, Wall Street is very focused on growth. If a firm misses, misses its growth targets, for example, in any given quarter, the price usually reacts quite sharply. And on the flip side, if a business beats its growth estimates, stocks often react very positively. But what the majority of investors fail to understand is 
that growth alone is worthless or not necessarily creating shareholder value. What you need to do, however, is to look at growth in combination with return metrics like ROE. Higher profits alone are not valuable and do not create shareholder value. And to quote Buffett again, the primary test of managerial economic performance is the achievement of a high earnings rate on equity capital employed without undue leverage, accounting, gimmickry, etc. And not the achievement of consistent gains in earnings per share. Now I can imagine that some of you might be confused by the fact that growth in and of itself is not valuable. Well, it's easy to get confused by this, but don't worry, I have two excellent resources for you that might help you understand this yeah, concept. First, the Twitter user 10 Diver wrote a wonderful thread on this subject. And secondly, let me show you another Terry Smith clip that outlines in very simple terms why investors always need to consider how much additional capital was needed to generate an increase in earnings. And I will add some of my own illustrations to what he is explaining here. If you let people put more and more capital at work at lower and lower returns, they are bound to show some earnings growth. But it doesn't mean they're creating any value. Again, coming back to the bank, think of it this way. You've got 100 euros with the bank and they pay you five in interest. Presumably you get five at the end of the year. If you double the amount of capital in the bank to 200 and they pay you seven and a half, would that be a great result? I don't think it would be because you'd only be getting two and a half percent on the extra 100. In Tesco speak with earnings per share, they would say, oh, no, that's growth of 50%. It's great. You need to know what return on capital they're getting. Don't look at the growth in earnings per share. It's an illusion. It's not a creation of value. So one key takeaway here is that a slow growing business that, however, earns high returns on capital might be more valuable than a business that grows much more rapidly, much more quickly, but generates poor returns on capital. That's because the latter business needs much more additional capital in order to produce yeah, additional earnings. More capital than the first one at least. It needs to reinvest a larger pro proportion of its earnings back into its business in order to fund the same kind of growth. Now we are almost done here, but there are two more very powerful les lessons that I want you to learn here. So bear with me please. What's important to acknowledge is that just looking at ROE in any single given year is practically worthless. We live in a capitalist system and high above average return on equity metrics will naturally attract competition, which in turn will often lower a firm's return on equity. At least if it does not possess some kind of yeah, structural advantage that yeah, protects its outstanding profitability. Thus, intelligent investors should always consider the long-term average of ROE and yeah, consider how ROE might yeah, develop in the future. Yeah, and you should observe the long-term trend of ROE very carefully. And now let me quote Chris Meyer, who you might know, who is the, the author of the wonderful investment book, uh, 100 Beggars. In a recent blog post, he wrote the following. Since the road to 100 beggardom is a long and twisty road with lots of hills and valleys, you can't just do it in one year. You want a business that can crank out those high returns year after year. That means that you have to think about a lot of other things as well, like competition and growth potential and the ability to withstand economic cycles, etc. Now the thought experiment that I mentioned in the beginning of this video was that if you were only allowed to look at one single metric before buying a stock, which one would you choose? Now, if you, if you were allowed to add just one more metric, a second metric, it would be a company's, I would choose the company's reinvestment rate because a high ROE number without any growth is also worthless, which is why McKinsey concludes that even executives at the best companies often wrestle with strategic decisions in order to reach the right balance between growth and returns. So of course, a firm that wants to generate wonderful returns needs to have a lot of reinvestment opportunities. And the reality is that very yeah, few businesses can reinvest almost all of their earnings at attractive rates for a long period of time. So an important formula here is that expected growth in net income equals reinvestment rate multiplied by ROE. So let me give you an example here. A firm that earns a 25% return on capital on its investments and reinvests 50% of its free cash flow back into the business 
can be expected to grow about 20% a year over the long term. And to quote from Chris Meyer again, so that's return on capital. But what about the ability to reinvest? The ability to reinvest means that, again, ideally, you want a business that can take all of its profits and reinvest them back in the business and earn that high return on capital again and again and again, etc. In the real world, few companies can do this. Therefore, just as return on capital leads you think about different questions, so too with reinvestment. You'll have to think about what a business does with the cash it generates. Capital allocation becomes important. You have to think about management. But at the end of the day, the two most important things are, again, a high return on capital plus the ability to reinvest. Yeah, and I think with, with that, we will wrap it up here. Make sure to check out some of my other videos. And as always, may your finances and investments prosper. Good luck.